Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's session on social media, digital disruption, and technology, and how we can become a world-class technological organization. For those who came in early, um, I was not Lyndall Herbert. Uh, Lyndall's a good deal better looking and a good deal younger than me, so uh, she did the morning session for this program and it ran exceptionally well, so let's hope this afternoon does the same. Um, I'm John Dorian. I'm a member of the National Board of Australian Red Cross and a volunteer in the Community Visitors Scheme in Sydney. Uh, I'm Unlike many people here, I'm, I'm very new to Red Cross, uh, two years and three months, so uh, every time I meet with Red Cross people, I learn something new and I learn more things new today, so that's great. We've got a, a, a very interesting uh, package of uh, presenters here today. Uh, the format is I'm going to talk for just a few minutes and introduce the, some issues and uh, questions, and then each of the uh, four panellists will talk and uh, I think you'll find what they say is ex exceptionally, exceptionally interesting. Then we'll come back uh, at the end and we should have time for uh, a range of different questions. So uh, as we go through, just think of some of those as we're uh, progressing. Uh, there's no doubt that we're experiencing a time of considerable uh, technological innovation and we live in an increasingly connected world. But as we heard from one of our speakers uh, earlier today, there are still lots of uh, fragmented communities out there and we need to look at ways in which we can touch those. Uh, if you think about how we communicate with each other and with other groups, uh, it's a lot different to what we did three, four uh, years ago. If you think about how we access information, how we analyze that information, how we manipulate that information, and disseminate it, uh, again, it's different to what we did uh, uh, even a year ago. Uh, accessing news, someone like me, I no longer have to go through the daily grind of work, so by the time I've finished my tea and toast and marmalade in the morning, uh, I've been through five or six newspapers and, and got the information that I wanted uh, for the day, and that's, uh, uh, that's really good, but it's also how you as individuals, particularly younger people, don't just access news, they make news and then they disseminate it. So you become the, the, uh, the journalists and the, uh, the broadcasters. Images are a perfect example. How do, if you go back to the, the film and the camera, the digital camera, and now you've got phones with uh, high quality uh, camera images and again you can capture and disseminate images in a way which we couldn't do uh, two or three years ago. You use social media and, uh, and other forms of connectivity to, to engage with people, to influence and to organise and we'll hear some of the ways in which people uh, can use those technologies to organise groups for specific purposes and specific challenges. And then there is the data and the metadata. So you, you need to understand that, that people are watching what you do whenever you buy uh, a newspaper and you use a credit card, whenever you shop at a supermarket. They're watching what you're doing, they understand what your shopping patterns are and then they target campaigns to, uh, to help draw you in. But really one of the questions that we need to think about here today is how do we at Red Cross harness the benefits of digital transformation to engage with our clients, staff, members, volunteers and supporters to help, to help us deliver better outcomes for the people that we help when they're in a period of vulnerability. So we've got a, a, a panel here of four people. Uh, it's a good balance between skilled technologists, digital strategy advisors, uh, thought leaders, nonprofit digital innovators. Uh, importantly, 
these four people are at the forefront of the debate around digital transformation, uh, and they work today at the digital coalface. So let me just introduce those to you briefly. Uh, first, we have uh, Frank Farrell. Frank is a partner at Deloitte and is the lead partner for Deloitte Digital uh, and an information technology specialist. He's been delivering innovative business solutions to clients in Australia, Asia, and the USA since late 1990s. He has substantial experience in the delivery of mobile application development, social media, and digital content management initiatives as well as large-scale broadband telecommunication programs of work. His client base spans telecommunications and financial service industries and includes federal and state public sector organisations. Prior to beginning his career at Deloitte, Frank led large-scale e-commerce and broadband technology initiatives in the US telecommunications sector for organisations such as KPMG and Sprint. He holds a Bachelor of Administration from Clemson University and a Bachelor's Degree from Lipscomb University in the United States. So please welcome Frank. <laughs> uh, Angela Ferguson is the Managing Director of ThoughtWorks Australia, providing strong and effective leadership combined with calm presence and a drive to deliver better results in a variety of roles. In addition to senior leadership roles, uh, she delivers, sorry, she's led delivery and organisational change programs within multiple industry domains, both here and overseas. ThoughtWorks is a global technology company and community of passionate individuals with an objective to revolutionise the technology industry and advocate for social and economic justice while running a sustainable business. They help clients with ambitious missions to bring powerful ideas to market to discover and to deliver. So please welcome Angela. <laughs> uh, Anna Robinson is the Director of Business Development for Change.org, the world's largest platform for social change with over two million Australian users and over 75 million globally. She leads Change.org's work supporting and providing strategic advice to leading nonprofits on their digital campaigning strategies in the Asia Pacific region. Change.org works with more than a thousand leading organizations globally and has offices in 18 countries. This gives Anna unique insights into cutting edge digital strategies being used by organizations to support their mission. Prior to joining Change.org, Anna spent 10 years in the nonprofit and socially focused private sector in a range of roles. Her experience includes policy development, attracting social investment, and managing social infrastructure bonds, developing strategic partnerships, and securing multi-million dollar grants in Australia and in the UK. Anna is currently completing a Master in Public Policy at Melbourne University's School of Government. So please welcome Anna. <clears throat> And David Poutley is the general manager of, uh, in Melbourne for DT Digital, a full service digital agency with over 200 digital professionals working across some of Australia and New Zealand's leading brands. David has over 15 years experience working in data and digital marketing and believes passionately in the combined power of creativity and technology to help organisations thrive in the digital age. So please welcome David. <laughs> so, um, Frank, over to you. All right, so it's, uh, it's fantastic to be here today, you know, to, to help you guys celebrate you know, your 100-year your celebration. And, and I think that what's excellent is that, you know, you're looking backward and you're celebrating your heritage but then you're also looking forward, you're looking ahead to the topics that are gonna be incredibly important for you as, as an organization in the, in the coming years. And, and to us you know, at Deloitte, we've been studying the, the topic of digital disruption in the Australian economy in, in depth for about three years. And we believe that this is an incredibly important topic for every organization in our economy. And you know, based on the discussion that we had uh, this morning starting out, 
and, and the dialogue from, from the audience. This is something that's absolutely front of mind for you guys, and I, I applaud you for, for taking this, this head on. So the, the title of my presentation is, is Short Fuse Big Bang, and w when we look at digital disruption in the economy, we're seeing very significant disruption happening very fast. And so the, the onus on organizations to respond and, and respond to that bang is, is something I think is incredibly important. And where I, I like to start a lot of these discussions is, is talking a bit about what is digital. So I consult to a lot of executive uh, clients and, and, and board groups, and in a lot of cases where we're talking about a digital transformation program or a digital strategy, we'll lose the first 30 to 45 minutes of a really important meeting where we're trying to make big decisions debating what is digital or arguing about what is digital. And I actually think that there are other questions to ask. So, so for the purpose of, of today, digital is all, all modern technology right now. All modern technology is based on binary code. It's ones and zeros. So you can kind of park that discussion. And that's as technical as, as I'll get in, in this presentation. So, so the question becomes, how do we apply modern technology to the problems and the challenges and the opportunities that we have in an organization. So being a consultant, it makes me comforted to have a framework and, and helps me organize the, the way I look at the world. And so, so just a real simple framework to then help you think through that, that question. There, there's three fundamental areas where digital technology can, can impact you. The, the first is in, in driving revenue growth or, or customer engagement. So expanding your reach out into the marketplace, whether that's you know, picking up additional supporters, donations, and the like getting the, the people that you're already engaged with to help you know, expand that coverage or, or getting you know, new members, new individuals engaged. The internal efficiency piece, so using technology to drive you know, automation of processes or to connect individuals so that they're collaborating better across geographies or across business units or, or things like that. And then the business model change around your future prospects. You, know, you think about Uber and Airbnb and what those companies are doing in the marketplace right now to very traditional businesses. You, know, you think about the taxi services business that's hundreds of years old. It hasn't changed since we went from the horse and buggy to the, to the car, to the automobile. So we're seeing rapid change there. That's fundamentally about business model. So, so when you look at this as an organization around your response to digital disruption, it's not always about building an application. It's not always about putting up a social page or something like that. It might be as mundane as looking at how are we managing our tax position? Can we get an R&D tax credit for a project that we're doing, an investment that we're making? Should we be doing merger and acquisition activity? Should we be exiting old assets and acquiring new ones? Or should we be acquiring them in a, a new geography and then supporting the launch through digital? So I think having that holistic view of a digital response is incredibly important. And, and what that means then is that everybody in the organization can play a role. So the finance team can determine what's the best way to address the tax situation here. The HR team can work out what is our operating model, what's the best way for us to organize ourselves and structure. So of course it's important to get the technology right and to connect with customers and supporters and donors, but it's, it's looking at it holistically that's incredibly important around getting the, the full response to, to disruption. This is kind of a, a map of the economy that we did. We, we, we did some very detailed research about uh, two years ago and looked at the impact of digital disruption on the Australian economy. And, and what we found is that over two-thirds of the economy, both public and private sector, will see at least 30% change in a, in a five-year period from 2012 to 2017 due to digital technology ad advancing. And so I, I, I referred to Short Fuse Big Bang. That's, sec that's a sector of the economy that's seeing significant change in a very accelerated way. So media, retail, we've already seen that. But financial services and banking you know, with, uh, with Apple Pay coming through, the banks are looking at, you know, our payments ecosystem is, is changing. How do we make sure that we're not, you know, knocked out of the equation there? You know, is, is Apple going to become the credit card through that? Professional services, you know, legal firms, recruitment firms. Look at what LinkedIn has done to recruitment firms. And then even a firm like Deloitte, a professional services firm, the graduates and the younger people in our business that used to come through and spend their first few years organi organizing and managing data and learning their trade, that activity is now largely automated by software. So do we need as many of them, and what do they do when they come through? So, so these are really fundamental questions that are happening. On the, what we call the long fuse Big Bang end, that's your, your government services, healthcare, education, areas where we believe there will be significant disruption, 
but because of the complexity of the stakeholder environment, the regulation, that, that disruption will happen in a, in a longer time scale. But we're, we're going to see very significant di disruption around the way that, that uh, organizations operate. And if you think about you know, what's been in the news just in the last six months of, of this year around the headlines and, and digital disruption, you know, there, there's huge examples. I've, I've mentioned Alipay, or, uh, uh, Apple Pay, but um, Alibaba, how familiar are you guys with, with Alibaba as a business? They've been in the news quite a lot recently. So they're, they're basically, Alibaba is, if you took eBay and Amazon.com and jammed them together, it's, it's China's largest e-commerce, it's the largest e-commerce business in the world. They've just gone public on the, the New York Stock Exchange. Alibaba has a finance offering called Alipay. So it's like PayPal for, for Chinese customers. And Alipay started to allow about 10 or 11 months ago customers of Alibaba to keep cash in their account. And what they're doing is they're paying a, a market rate, a, 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 an interest rate that's 2% above market. So what you're seeing is, is Chinese savers rushing in to put cash into Alipay. So in the space of about eight months upon launch, they had over 100 US billion dollars go into Alipay as a, as a savings bank, basically. So if you're a Chinese bank, you know, if you're the head of strategy at a Chinese bank, were you planning for that to happen? You know? if, if you're an Australian bank, what's the Alipay equivalent? You know, who's, who's planning to disrupt you? you know, so you, you can see the, the scale of the potential disruption and the speed at which it might come through. Over there on the, the far end, down at the, at the bottom, that's a, a photo of uh, London cabbies jamming the streets in, in London on, on strike. And what they're doing is they're responding to Uber and, and they're, you know, they're trying to get the government to, to block Uber and, and to push back and to heavily regulate Uber. It's actually the best free advertising they could have done for Uber. It was front page news for, for weeks. You know, and, and, and we've seen this in, in Paris and in New York. So you know, I mentioned it's a 100-year-old industry that hasn't seen disruption, but in the space of just a few years, Uber's become a $10 billion market cap business, the projections on its value, because it's, it's come in, it's disrupted, it's, it's provided a, a new business model and a, a new way of, of working and, and thinking. So I think this is, this is very, very relevant in Australia. And as you guys think about your stakeholder groups that, that you're working through, this is what they're going to look like. This is the statistics around them. You know, Australians are some of the most voracious adopters of digital technology in the world. And I'm an adopted Aussie. You won't be able to tell by my accent. But I've been here about 14 years. And I've, I've seen this build where you know, we've got 20 million adults in the country right now, but over 34 million mobile devices. And, and David Thody, the CEO of Telstra, thinks that by 2017, it'll be over 100 million devices as we all pick up wearable technology and have you know, wearables all over our body. So your default position is that, is that your core stakeholder group that you're engaging with is going to have multiple devices, mobile devices. They're very mobile connected. And then the, the top thing that they do on those devices, they spend the equivalent of two full business days a month on social, social networks, looking at social media. It's the stickiest application on the internet. So if you're thinking about how do I connect with Australian consumers, you know, the stakeholders that we want to help us with our organization, you've got to be thinking mobile, you've got to be thinking social, because that's, that's where the Australian consumer is at. And the, the trends that's driving digital disruption, we're going to talk about these in, in great detail um, throughout the, the panel. <clears throat> it's mobile, social, data, and cloud. Those are the technologies that, that you need to know about. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you think about the history of technology, you know, how we've gone from the mainframe to the PC to the internet. Any one of these technologies could have been the next thing. It could have been the move from PC to internet to mobile or to social. But the fact that these are all converging and coming together is what's really driving that disruption. So now a 19-year-old in his university dorm can, can sit down and start a business for less than $1,000. They can get a, a payroll package and an accounting package like zero for $59.95 a month, no contract, pay with a credit card, that you would have had to have a, a large commercial business several years ago. You would have had to have gone out and get venture capital or a big bank loan to, to set that up, you know, have hardware, have real estate to put it in, and then you would have had to hire a marketing department to get the word out about your service or your product. But through social networks, all you have to have is a valid product, a valid idea, and then an audience and then they'll connect with you and, and they'll, they'll share the ideas about your product. And so you know, the, the topic of using social to get your customer to work for you for free is something that's incredibly important. And we've talked about a constrained funding environment 
you know, for donations and, and the work that, that you guys are doing, that concept's really important. And, and if you think about the examples, um, you know, every review that's ever been written on TripAdvisor or Facebook is a customer working for those businesses for free. In fact, when I, when I go on holidays, I use TripAdvisor to plan it, and then I come back, and I'll be there on a, a weekend, and I've got 400 unread emails that I've got to get caught up on. But the first thing I do is I crack open the laptop on a Saturday with a cup of coffee, is I update my TripAdvisor reviews because I'm only two badges away, two reviews away from that next badge. <laughs> you know, so, so I'm fairly time poor, but I work for TripAdvisor for free. Woolies, I told a story in the, the session this morning about how my wife and I, you know, we like the self-checkout function at, at Woolies. And uh, we were out shopping a, a couple weeks ago, and we saw there was a bit of a line, there were like three people in line for the self-checkout, and there was a checkout person about 15 meters away that had no one in line. They were sitting there ready to go. And so my wife and I, we, we looked at this line, we looked over at that checkout person, we looked at ourselves, we looked back at this line, we said, we're gonna stay in this line. Because we like checking out our groceries. We work for Woolworths for free. You know, I work for Qantas for free every week when I go to check in for a flight on my mobile phone. It used to be I'd line up and then a staff member would give me a boarding pass. And I work for National Australia Bank every week when I go in and I check my balances and I do transactions. So I think that topic, you know, and it, it delights customers to be able to do these things in the way that they want to do it and they work for you for free. So that's an incredibly important when you're in a funding constrained environment using digital technology to do that, to, to get that dynamic to, to happen. And, and in a non-for-profit, a recent example that I, that I really like, the, uh, how many of you are familiar with the Ice Bucket Challenge? Yeah, good, I, th I thought so. So, you know, if you think about the ALS, the, the motor neuron disease, the, the fundraising activity that, that happened there, you know, globally there was $100 million raised in the space of a few months with the Ice Bucket Challenge. And for those of you who don't know what it is, basically, you, you go you pour a bucket of ice water on your head and then you challenge five other people to do it. And then you post the video on your social network on Facebook or, or Twitter or email it around. And so, you know, ALS charities raised globally about $3 million last year. They raised $100 million this year because somebody decided it'd be a good idea to get people to pour ice buckets of ice water on their heads. They were working for them for free. And this, this scaled dramatically. This is. Um, example of a Deloitte partner, Kevin Russo, who um, sits on the board of an AS, ALS foundation in Australia, and he's the one that kicked it off with this Facebook post here, out to five other partners in Deloitte, and then it went viral. We had over 1,000 people participate this in, in our firm and raise over $100,000. So this is at our annual partners conference that happened mid-September, kind of like the equivalent of, of, uh, of this conference. We had four screens up, and it showed all the different videos of, of people dumping buckets of ice water on their head. In fact, one of our partners was wearing a penguin onesie when he did it. You know, some of this got a bit ridiculous, but it was fun. People wanted to show off, they wanted to do it, and they wanted to challenge, and we raised a lot of money in doing it. So, so we worked for free for this and, and had a lot of fun. So, so to wrap up, in, in terms of how does your organization respond to digital disruption, what do you do? Basically, it's, it's know your customer. Will your customer, will your stakeholder dump a bucket of ice water over their head for you do they sleep with their smartphone next to their bed and they check their Facebook page as the first thing they do when they wake up in the morning before they brush their teeth or kiss their spouse good morning? Is that what they do? Then how do you engage with them? Then invest in the digital technology. Now, sometimes that means investing in platform and, and making an investment. It might just mean investing in the skills to be able to use the tools that are out there to get the message out about your, your initiative and what you're doing. But importantly, as you do that, you've got to drive a digital culture. You know, you've got to have the individuals that understand how to get that, how to get those ideas out, how to optimize that for mobile, and you have to talk about it as an organization. It's got to be some, something that just becomes normal. And then finally, you don't do these as a series of projects and declare victory and go home. It's got to be a continuous way of working. It's got to be the way that, that your, your constituents are going to want to engage, so it has to be something that, that is ongoing and is not just project-based. So I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of recommendations for going forward. And again, I really commend you guys for, for thinking about this topic and, and, and taking it very seriously. Thank you.
doesn't work. Is that good yet? Excellent. Ooh. So I always use notes because I have the worst memory in the world. And I'm, I'm really envious of, of folks that don't need to do that. So I'm working on it. So I am from ThoughtWorks. And we're a, a, a collection of incredibly passionate and curious individuals with, with titles like developer and tester and data scientist and experience designer and an increasing list of titles that didn't exist 10 years ago. And it's an exciting place to work. Curious people are curious not just about technology, but curious about the world around them. And, and it's, it's those sorts of people that I find really exciting. And I think it's people like you that have that mission that drives you as very different roles interacting with an organization. It's that mission that drives you that's really exciting to me. So when I talk about tech, um, the first thing I want to do is, is definitely explain that there is no silver bullet waiting in the wings of technology just to solve all of the problems that you're facing. And, and some folks in the tech industry that are, I guess, a little more naive about social change and about social movements think that that is possible. And I don't think it comes from a bad place. I think it's about excitement and curiosity. But I think software has an immense power in being able to enable the kind of change that we're looking at. But it's in combination with people. It's in combination with people that have capability, that have the information, that understand, and most importantly, are engaged to deliver for you. So I wanted to talk about a, a, a few factors, three, in fact, around what I think has driven a lot of the disruption that we're talking about. And one of those is around some of the technologies that Frank talked about before. But the first one I wanted to talk about was a shift in approach. So traditionally, in the social sector and, and quite frankly in the commercial sector, the way that software has been delivered has been that a group of people get together, they decide what's right and what's good for everybody else, they develop that and then they roll it out. And that central view, apart from one thing, is, is very expensive. It's also not the best way to get software and to get tools into people's hands. And it might seem really obvious to you because when it comes to social change, you're probably used to that fact. If you don't engage the beneficiaries, it's really hard to get those things to stick. But for us technologists, we're a bit slower. <laughs> it took us a while to get to understand the importance of engaging the end users and the beneficiaries all the way through that process. And there's been a bunch of studies done on the incremental and iterative approaches to technology that show that it's also just financially the best way to go. So it shows, for example, um, three times the success rate. There's a huge level of failure in software projects. If you use iterative incremental approaches, three times as likely to succeed. And where failures do happen, the overruns in cost and in time are less. But if it's so obvious, why isn't everybody doing it? Even in the commercial sector where you feel like people are driven more by those you know, bottom line figures, it's still not incredibly common. There's probably getting to the point where it's a tipping point of the majority following these processes, but it's still not everybody. And if it's so great, why isn't it? And the answer is actually that it's a mindset shift and it's a culture shift that are key in making this change. And a lot of organizations overlook how difficult that organizational change from that culture and mindset point of view are and focus instead on tools and processes and technology. And there's a, a famous quote by a management consultant whose name I have forgotten, um, but he suggests that if you don't take advantage of, of thinking about this from a cultural change perspective, all of the best intentions and plans and strategies will just be eaten by your culture, just be eaten for breakfast. So you need to make sure those things are taken into account. The other is that these changes, agile and lean are the terms that are often used, were born out of constraint not out of having a, a huge amount of resources to bear. Lean came out of post-war Japan, where they just didn't have as much, enough capital to buy all of the, the parts they needed to, to create cars. So they had to come up with something that worked in constraint. And we're seeing that in tech as well, and I'm going to talk about a few examples there. So one is the approach, and it's a mindset and a cultural change. The second is about tech. So you talked about cloud, you talked about data, you talked about mobile, and you talked about social. Um, and at a really basic level, 
cloud is about being able to rent infrastructure space from organizations that have that as their specialization. So instead of, certainly when I started my career, procuring hardware took months. And it was incredibly expensive, and it had to support the busiest time of year. Now you can just ramp that up and down, or you can pay someone else to decide how to ramp it up and down. You can outsource these things incredibly easily and incredibly cost effectively. And the addition to that is that once it's in the cloud, it's accessible everywhere. So you talked about, again, the, the number of devices. I have two with me today. I'm wearing a wearable, and I've, I've got my phone in my bag. Um, I also have a tablet at home. I have a laptop. Probably got other things that aren't coming to mind. But it means that any time I access services that are in the cloud from any of those devices, I can do the same thing from any other device. I don't have to think about transferring files and things like that. So it's incredibly powerful when you're thinking about getting information into the hands of the people that you're delivering services to. And again, if you think about service delivery, we talked about adoption of digital in Australia. It's not just amongst the more privileged and the more affluent. So Info Exchange, do you guys know Info Exchange? I've seen some nods. So they, they worked on a study with a university whose name I've also forgotten. I think it was Adelaide University, but I can check for you and found 95% of homeless people in Australia, in metropolitan areas, have mobile phones, and 70% of, or 77% have smartphones that have access to free Wi-Fi. And the important part there is free. So I remember a similar study done a few years ago, people may have had phones, but there was still an, that massive gap on access to the internet and access to services. That has shifted. There are still areas that have not shifted, but in metropolitan areas, that change is pretty significant. The other piece just that I'll touch on on data that I didn't mention this morning is there's, there's a lot of talk about data in the press at the moment, and one thing that um, the Centre for Australian Progress has, has been talking to us about a little bit is you know, that sort of Spider-Man comment of, with great data comes great responsibility. I don't know if you've heard that before. But, a fear of if I'm collecting people's data, what's my responsibility? And, and given things like the Snowden revelations, how do I protect myself? And thankfully, there are ways that technologists are looking to actually solve some of those problems, which is how can we take less information to be able to have the same types of conversations? The Germans even have a word for it that is not translatable that I will attempt to pronounce, which is Datensparsenkeit. And it's actually in their legislation which is about how do you take an austere approach to data that gives organizations what they need to deliver services, but doesn't have people taking all of the information to decide what to do with it later. And there's a lot of new approaches in that area. All of those technologies, together with different types of approaches that are more inclusive of beneficiaries and end users, have driven, I think, the third aspect of change, which is this fundamental shift in power to end users. So instead of organizations just being able to decide what to do and broadcasting that out, there's much more of a conversation now between organizations and consumers. We're seeing consumers being able to dictate to companies through social media how to respond to, say, customer service requests, um, to their response to, to sponsoring. I think we've all seen things through change.org around and other organizations around sponsorship of radio and when certain things happen, how to actually pressure organizations to change. That consumer shift is just incredibly powerful. And it doesn't only happen, again, in affluent and organized areas. I think there's, there's an example of transactions, and, and you spoke about, I think, Apple Pay just before. Has anyone heard of M-Pesa? So five years ago, it was already common usage in Tanzania, in Kenya and in Afghanistan to be able to transact person to person using a mobile phone, cash. So I could use my phone and give you cash. Small amounts of, of money that don't have to go through a bank. That was born of necessity of people only having small amounts of money and not having access to banking services. And five years later, Snapchat's just launched the same thing as a convenience item for consumers. And it's interesting to see how much more of those sorts of aspects of people power and powered by constraints innovation that are bringing those things to, to Australia and to the US and to the UK as convenience items. 
So a couple of other examples. One was the working for you for free. I don't know if you guys have heard of Pizza Mogul by Domino's. So that's pretty much what that's about. Yes, it's an excellent fundraising tool for some organizations. Basically, you create a pizza, you design it through Domino's, Domino's will then put that on the website, other people can buy that pizza, and Domino's stores will then fulfill that pizza and deliver it. And you get a clip of the ticket, so you get 25 cents up to $2.50 depending on the pizza. Someone's made $35,000, which is you know, more than Domino's actually expected anybody would ever make, which is still cool. The difference is they've got people that are now flyering in their local neighbourhoods. They've got people that are sharing on social media, please go and buy my pizza. It's still Domino's. And actually there's been this halo effect of that, of people doing marketing for Domino's for free that has had an uptick in results across the board. And so again, thinking about engaging your people, not just to respond to issues and not just to, to um, come along to events like this, but to actually do work for you for free. Transactional work is pretty exciting. Um, a couple of other examples that I'll talk through because I like telling stories. Um, does anyone know about the Australian Indigenous Mentoring Program or Mentoring Experience? So it's a brilliant program. They've been scaling in recent years and one of their big constraints was their ability to train the mentors. They wanted to make sure they were providing the same quality of experience across the board but at a much larger scale. So they came to us and we talked through the sorts of challenges they were experiencing and they talked through their constraints because they're a constrained organisation and if they were able, and this was the conversation, if they were able to give us access to their mentors, to new mentors, to people that were being, is menteed the word? I'm not really sure. But all of those different humans that were part of the exchange, them being involved in building an online solution for training meant that we were able to deliver that in four weeks. If we'd gone through traditional methods of go and talk to some different people and come up with it, it just, there's no way we could have done that. And so it required a big commitment on their part and an engagement and a big shift. But it actually allowed us to deliver very quickly. So on dramatically the other side of the scale, on a whole new level of bureaucracy and size, is the UK government. Um, <laughs> so we've worked with, with government digital services for the last probably two years, and they've gone from a position of having about 3,000 different websites with different navigation, with different approaches to finding information, with an inability to find a phone number to talk to a person, which is the default backup position, to having basically a single integrated gov.uk front door. They're still going through that process. They're still adding new sites to it. But so far, they've saved $70 billion. And that's, a lot of that is due to no one needs, or very few people need to pick up the phone and then talk to a person to find out what they could have found easily online. And that is through engaging end users in the design, and it's through engaging producers and service providers with, with absolute access to the people building the solutions. Because for too long, IT's been stuck in the basement and we haven't had a really good conversation. And it's not nice down there. We actually like people and we'd like to talk to you guys. I think one of the things to keep in mind on that is that all of the code that was used to produce those services is freely available for other governments to use. And that's another movement we're seeing increasingly in the tech sector, which is instead of expensive proprietary packages, People are much more open to sharing the basis and the platform so that others can get advantages out of it. And that's something we're really conscious of, of driving as well. So I've probably already gone over time because I always do. But I guess in closing, as you proceed on your mission and can think about how technology can extend your reach and think about how participating in technology can help technology get better outcomes for you, don't freak out because you don't have to do it alone. You can make friends with technologists. We're nice people. We like to talk about the cool stuff that we do. But most importantly, the people that you're trying to reach, the breakthroughs that we're talking about mean that people don't need to know about technology to be able to engage with technology anymore. You know, we were talking before um, with Lyndall about my mum's just started texting and her mum's just started texting and there's lots of extra spaces in every text that we get, and we don't quite understand that, but we still get the text. Um, and my mum doesn't understand how to use her computer, and my dad 
even less, quite frankly. Um, but they don't need to know about technology as a smartphone. And that's been one of the really powerful shifts, which is when thinking about service delivery, technology is no longer just for the technical enabled folks, and no longer just for the kids as well. And so that's it from me, and I'll hand over to, is it you next? Excellent, thank you. Getting, getting. I got sound? No. Yes? Excellent. There's a little bit of irony, isn't there, in like the technology not working for the technology session. We had the same problem before. We'll get better at it, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, it's really great to be here and talking to a group of people, especially a group of people who are fundamentally committed to social change and making the world better. And that's what I want to talk about, is how technology can be an agent for that kind of social change. Um, so picking up on some of the stuff that Angela was talking about as well. So to start out, I just wanted to start by telling you a little bit about change.org. I'm actually hoping that a decent proportion of the people in this room are using change.org already. Um, our mission is to empower people everywhere to create the change they want to see in the world. It's a big ambition. Um, what we're not is, we're not a campaigning organisation, we are a platform and when Angela was talking about sort of open source, this is the kind of social end of the open source if you like, that we don't create the campaigns, we just create a platform where any person can elevate their voice, aggregate a whole bunch of other people that are interested in that issue and get traction on that issue and make change. Um, and the vision is a world where no one is powerless to make that change and making change is a part of everyday life for every single person in the world. And when I talked to Ben Rattray, who's our founder and CEO, he literally means every single person in the world um, and fundamentally changing the way that democracy works. He's a very ambitious man <laughs> and it might take a little while. And it works. So, you know, we actually, in the last session, we had a question about slacktivism and that's, or clicktivism as some people like to call it, but the simple fact of the matter is it actually does work and this is a small handful of victories that have happened as a result of the platform from Boy Scouts agreeing to accept gay troops for the first time in the US to India regulating the sale of acid after an acid attack victim started a campaign through to, some of you might have signed this one hopefully, Wicked Campers, removing very sexist slogans earlier this year in Australia, you know, corrupt officials in Brazil, there's all sorts of stuff going on and it ranges from the very, very small and local, like save your local pool, through to these big kind of meaty issues, We've got a huge campaign going on in Indonesia at the moment to basically save democratic rights to elect local government officials. And we're growing fairly quickly. <laughs> um, actually, I should have I said earlier, I should have updated this graph. We're actually at 85 million users worldwide now. We've got users in every single country in the world. And in Australia, this is what it looks like. So when we started in Australia, I launched in Australia about two years ago, we had about 40,000 users. We hit two million earlier in the year and we're now sitting at about 2.5 million. And, you know, that's a bit of a vanity metric. Oh, it's great that we've got all these people. But when you think about it, what that's really saying is one in ten Australians has taken action on an issue that they care passionately about on the platform. That says a lot about the world we live in, right? Um, and we're pretty ambitious too. We want this to be at least five million by sort of this time next year, ideally. And one in ten... Of, so in addition to the one in ten Australians taking action, We've actually had 1.1 million people participate in a victory on the platform in Australia. And these aren't just, you know, like Angela was saying, it's not just the already privileged. Um, there are a lot of people that wouldn't be able to participate in social change if it wasn't for technology. So, you know, one of the stats that really jumps out for us is 40% of our users live in rural areas. 
that's really significant because for them to go out and participate, say, in an event like this would be particularly challenging. Um, we also have a lot of women and a lot of parents, actually, um, and women are really the standouts, actually, in terms of petition starters, so they're the real change agents. And they're not slacktivists. They're also people that are engaging in a lot of other ways around these issues. So 86% of our users in Australia have participated in other forms of action in support of causes they care about. Some of the most common are you know, talking to their friends and family about the issue, which may seem like a small thing, but it's actually about spreading that impact. <coughs> talking to their MPs, writing letters, and actually a hell of a lot making donations. I'd be, the Red Cross hopefully is one of the organisations that they're donating to. And a lot of organisations are using the platform too. So we have 30,000 organisations that use change.org globally and we've had 70 million actions taken on behalf of those organisations and they're using it to similarly win their campaigns, build and connect with supporters and increase their fundraising revenues. So that's a little bit about us. Um, what I want to talk about is why online, I think online matters, and particularly why it matters to organisations like the Red Cross. So for me, it addresses the core challenge of building, and perhaps more importantly for any fundraisers in the room, uh, funding an effective movement, which is about engaging and mobilising support. Um, and it does it in two ways. And this first way is, I think, for me, the kind of simple way that it does it. Um, but it creates a medium to engage and mobilise a huge audience. And this is not just channel shift. So what I mean by that is it's not just the same people but using technology. It is a bit of that. But it's actually, like I said earlier, a whole bunch of people that you potentially wouldn't have been able to connect with otherwise that you can connect with through online. So, you know, here's a graph of what this looks like. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing obviously explosive growth in internet, in internet access, but I think what's really interesting and particularly for us is, you know, we have offices in lots of different countries and the areas where we're seeing the most explosive growth in using the platform are countries like India, Indonesia, Latin, parts of Latin America. Um, so yeah, it's an incredibly large and diverse audience that you can connect with for the first time. And a lot of people are using online to give money to organisations that they care about. And I know in the last session we had someone from the fundraising team here and I know that the Red Cross is already harnessing this quite effectively by the sounds of it. Um, but online giving is growing significantly as a proportion of giving. Um, and where other forms of giving are potentially quite stagnant, this seems to be the area that's accounting for a lot of growth. So online is important in a fundraising um, context as well. But for me, the way that is kind of less simple, um, but probably more important, is it's about the way that it's creating a new and inspired breed of citizens who actually feel like they can impact on the world around them. So you hear a lot about, you know, apathy in the political spectrum and people don't care anymore and how do we get people to vote and, you know, all of these kinds of questions. Well. The experience of change.org basically indicates that people do care. They might not have trust in the traditional processes, but they do care about the world around them. Um, and I want to talk about this in the context of this story. Um, and so I like telling stories as well, like Angela. Uh, this is Ayan. Um, when Ayan was two years old, her face was torn in half by a bullet when she was caught up in the Somali Civil War. And Ayan spent 20 years living like this. She couldn't sleep, she couldn't eat, she couldn't close her eyes properly. Um, and anyway, I've, uh, an amazing woman up in Brisbane found out about her case and her and her local Rotary Club raised enough funds to bring her out to Australia and Brisbane Private Hospital agreed to perform the surgery for free. Great. Problem is that when she applied for a visa, uh, she was rejected as a non-genuine visitor. I don't know, that's actually the term that they use, a non-genuine visitor. Now, as you can imagine, the team that had been fundraising for her were quite horrified by that, and they started a petition on change.org, and literally within three days, I think it was, that was up to 40,000 signatures. That's 40,000 people hearing this story, amazing story and saying, this isn't good enough. 
And I said earlier, I mean, I don't know if, if there's any people here who've ever had to try and campaign against the Department of Immigration or Scott Morrison before, but it's not, it's not an easy, easy task. Um, but funnily enough, they do listen when 40,000 people say this isn't good enough. Um, and her visa was granted. And I'm very pleased to say that in February of this year, Ayan had that surgery. Um, and she's gone back to her community and is living a much happier life as a result of that campaign and the people who were very, very kind in bringing her out here. And this is an important story, not just because of the impact on Ayan, her family and her community, but for me, this is an incredibly important story because of the 40,000 people that signed that campaign. Because if you think about what that says to those 40,000 people, some of whom might never have done something like this, and certainly the people who started the petition had never campaigned on anything or tried to change anything before. It tells them that they are actually capable of changing the world around them if they're willing to stand up and have their voices heard. So you, you then imagine what those 40,000 people going back out into their communities and the kinds of interactions they're potentially going to have. You know, are they then going to go out and start their own campaigns? Are they going to donate their time or money to the organisations around them? And this becomes an incredibly powerful way of demonstrating to people that you actually can change the world around you. I'm an idealist, in case you can't tell. <laughs> um, so what we're seeing is organisations are increasingly starting to capitalise on this. A lot of organisations like the Red Cross are doing lots of good work in the digital space already. But I just want to talk about a couple that I've been fortunate enough to work with this year, very briefly. Um, the first is a very large organisation. Has anyone here heard of Walk Free? Yeah? Um, so for those of you who haven't, Walk Free was started by Andrew Forrest, the mining magnet over in Western Australia. So they're not actually all evil. Um, <laughs> and it was started in May 2012. And as of about three weeks ago, they've got 8 million members of Walk Free. So they have been able to build a massive global movement that is designed to end modern slavery within this lifetime and they have raised millions of dollars, which is then being directed back out to the organisations that are working at the front line of human slavery. So in countries like India, parts of Africa, Brazil, and they've been able to release incredibly impactful research, um, the Global Slavery Index, which if you haven't read it, it was released recently, um, and use that network of eight million people to get that out across a huge network who probably didn't even know that this was an issue. So incredibly powerful and inspiring. And then at the other end of the spectrum is this organisation, Indigenous Community Volunteers. So it's a very small organisation. If you haven't heard of them, you should really go and find out about them. I really love this organisation. So they really, what they do is they get volunteers, um, everyday people, probably much like many of the people in this room, to go out and work in and with Aboriginal communities, delivering a whole range of community projects. But the biggest problem for them was getting that, actually getting people to know who they were and raise enough money to be able to deliver these projects. So we've been working with them recently. In the last few months, we've re recruited nearly 15,000 supporters for their organisation. So this is 15,000 new people who'd never heard about them. And they're raising a lot of money and actually finding new volunteers through that mechanism. So it's allowing them to multiply their impact out. So yeah, it's a, an incredible tool. I'm happy for people to email me. I, I think someone said earlier, oh, we'll, we'll filter the emails. I'm like, no, just eat. people can email me if they like um, to talk about this. But in particular, I just encourage everyone here to think about the things that you want to change. And obviously, there's a lot of people in this room that are already active in the social space and encourage the people around you to do the same. Thank you. Last technology point of failure, <laughs> potentially. Um, so here we go. Right. Oh, don't tell me that's worked. There you go. Look at that. <laughs> Too easy. That's all right. Yeah, round of applause for technology. Brilliant. Um, all right, I'm David Pountney. I'm um, general manager at a, a company called DT. Um, we're a creative technology agency, um, which actually digital transformation has become a thing in the last sort of two years, which 
lines up rather nicely with our initials. It didn't really start that way, but sometimes fortune just comes, comes your way that way. Um, we, when we talk about digital, we sort of believe very much in the intersection of creativity and technology because and it's a really hard thing to define digital as we talked about earlier and it's often connected to tech or associated with technology but technology really is just the enabler it's what you do with it that really that really matters you think about the wheel in its time was technology right and the wheel was a great piece of technology but it comes ideas and what people conceive to do with a wheel be it a bicycle a car a unicycle whatever you do with that wheel and the, and the ideation that is really what creates change and and creates great experiences so we believe very strongly in both, in, in, in equal balance, uh, and that's really where we see sort of great digital experiences come from. Um, I just want to share this quote with you. Companies are starting to see the light. They're embracing the principles that Apple, Google, and Philip Electronics have been advocating for a long time. Differentiate, differentiate yourself based on the experience you deliver to customers, not on the products you sell. And this is very much a mind change, a lot within the design thinking, but it's impossible to do a digital presentation without talking about Apple. But if you think about what Apple have done in the product space, they weren't the first with the MP3 player, but when they bought out the iPod, they made a beautiful design with four buttons and a beautiful little click wheel that just clicked a little bit as you did that, and, and, and therefore became the default MP3 player. They weren't the first with a mobile phone, but instead of a mobile phone that looked like an oversized calculator, they bought a touch screen, one single button, they made it usable and they made it desirable. They'll do the same with the watch, they've done the same with the iPad. It's about that experience and design and creativity that goes into experience, not necessarily the technology. In many ways, it's about getting the technology to get out of the way and just to create the experience. And great digital comes from that. Put another way, this concept of moving from tasks to experiences. And this is where we think, I guess, in digital technology, the evolution that's happened, where we, to technology for the last sort of 20 years and what's happened with IT was often around getting it into a space that is functional and at best convenient. So if I talk you through this pyramid, at the very base of the pyramid, we have functional, i.e. we have something that works as programmed. It does what we intend it to do. It's reliable, it's available and accurate. So in a hosting perspective, it's the site's up, right? 100% of the time, hopefully. I was saying earlier, like Google. If Google goes down, the whole world panics as to how the hell they're gonna find any information. Thankfully, Google doesn't go down. It's always reliable and accurate. Usable, it can be used without difficulty, great. And then convenient being super easy to use. And that's where a lot of user experience design in the digital space has helped get to a point of being easy to use. But that's where a lot of brands and digital experiences then stop. What we believe very strongly is in creating great digital engagement for organizations is really starting to move into this pleasurable and meaningful space. Pleasurable where an experience is a joy to interact with. So you take Google, for example. Google ticks those first four stages but with the Google Doodle, the little sort of change in the Google logo that celebrates some random event you'd never thought about or has a little video in it, that isn't a core functionality of a search engine. That does nothing more to help you find your search results or find information, but it brings a bit of pleasure to your day, right? a bit of pleasure that actually makes you still like Google and want to come back to them rather than considering another search engine. And increasingly now with meaningful, and that's really the big place that data plays such a huge role. Data allows us to create digital experiences that are far more meaningful and personal. From a Google point of view, Google Plus is all about that. It's trying to make my search results different to your search results to make them more relevant. And for you as an organization for Red Cross, you have that you have a beautiful space. You're already up in the top of that pyramid in terms of what you do as an organization. So really it's about how we can help create a digital experience that really complements that, that meaningful territory. Earlier this year, we were, um, we were really fortunate to get hold of two pairs of Google Glass. We somewhat smuggled them out of the US and they weren't technically supposed to be in Australia, so we did technically didn't have them earlier in the year, but we did have a couple of copies earlier in the year. And that was because the Australian government still hasn't sanctioned the use of Google Glass in public, which, as I said earlier, is a bit odd, really, because if you strapped a mobile phone to your face, that'd be all right. And that has a camera, has a camera and a screen and GPS and all the same function that Google Glass has, but because it's made into glasses, it means you can't use it. It's weird. Anyway, that's, that's, getting, that's getting changed. We got a couple of pairs of Google Glass, and so internally we decided to have a hackathon, and we went about this hackathon the whole wrong way, in that with digital and solving problems in a digital way, you should always start with a problem and then think about the right technology to solve that problem. What we did in this case is we started with the technology, which was we've got two pairs of Google Glass, what the hell do we do with them? And then we went in search of a problem, and that problem came in the form of the Red Cross and you and your centenary event. So, um, the problem, that sounded wrong. The problem came in the way of the Red Cross. That wasn't, that wasn't a problem. Terrible use, terrible use of term. 
it was more a situation of, it was a centenary event, and as you guys were looking back at the last 100 years, it became a really good opportunity to think, well, what could technology do for the Red Cross for the next 100 years? And what could Google Glass play in that, in the, in that evolution? So we briefed the team, so a hackathon, I should just I'll go back on a hackathon for a second for those that have a hackathon is when you get teams, multidiscipline teams together, normally over a 24 hour period, they don't have any sleep, and it's, and it's fun apparently, but that's what they do. You put them in teams, you set them a problem, and they hack in 24 hours to try and create a prototype of a product that really is just a prototype that we can test and explore and have a look at and see whether it's something that would, that would resonate or could be developed further. So that's what we did. So we briefed the teams. Uh, we've got the guys in for, from Red Cross, briefed on a few areas of, of, of your organization, sort of uh, offering the areas, areas you, you brought into. We let the teams decide what area they wanted to tackle, and we set them to work for 24 hours hacking on, on Google Glass. Now, there's a video now we'll play. We had a little bit of audio problem earlier, so we'll see how we go with the audio. If not, I'll just talk over it. Um, and I apologize for the matching shirts between, oh, hang on a sec. Let's go. Uh, we, we are videoless. Okay, yep. See, I knew the technology wasn't going to work. That had to happen, didn't it? There we go. Hi, I'm David Pountney, General Manager of DT in Melbourne. And at the back end of last year, we were fortunate enough to get our hands on two pairs of Google Glass as part of their Glass Explorer program. And I'm Paul Hayes from Australian Red Cross. This year, Red Cross is celebrating its centenary. And while we're looking back, we thought it'd be a good time to look at the next 100 years of how we can help people. So we posed a question to DT. How can you use Google Class to help Red Cross help humanity? So we thought, what better way than to kick this off with a hackathon? So from designers to developers, from creatives to strategists, we tasked all our teams to come up with ideas of how Glass could help the Red Cross help humanity. people is one of the toughest challenges. In a bushfire situation, you have to make one decision, to either stay or to leave. In a large-scale disaster situation, Red Cross volunteers can be overwhelmed with the amount of traumatised people they have to deal with. Our application, Red Cross Reunite, aims to accelerate and automate the registration and identification process of affected people. We are providing the social and isolated older people with the ability to stay at home and live by themselves. Our idea enables those volunteers to administer psychological first aid to those on the ground who need it most in real time. So we brought all the, the ideas together at the end of the hackathon. Most people were very tired. They were all presented and I, and I have to say it was probably definitely one of the highlights of my career. It was one of the most emotionally kind of charged uh, 24 hours we'd had. That's David Trewern, our founder. He got extremely emotional when we talked about one of the ideas we'll share with you in a second. But it was a great example of using technology and what technology can do from a humanity perspective. And I, I want to share with you the four favorite ideas that came out of this. Now, I'm not, I'm not standing here to say to you, these four ideas, we should take these in production tomorrow, they're brilliant. I don't necessarily think the time is right for this, but it does show where the technology could go from a Red Cross point of view over the next 100 years. So the first of those ideas was reunite around helping displaced people find each other after disasters. So using Google Glass to handle the tracking process could be faster and more efficient than filling out paper forms, especially if facial recognition is, in, is incorporated. So we're thinking there in a displaced situation where you have a large number of people, having technology right on your facing being able to go to take a photo, do facial recognition, record people's names, put it straight into a database, would actually potentially help move more people through and actually process more people quickly in a very time constrained situation. This was my favorite idea, and this was actually the winner within the Melbourne team, and it was called The Guardian, and it's primarily aimed at providing support for older people who live alone. So really thinking where te the telecross service could evolve from a technology perspective. It provides built-in apps for the isolated elderly, reminding them to take pills, telling them about the weather, sending alerts if the gyroscope indicates that a fall may have taken place. So the same in your phone has an inbuilt gyroscope. Google Glass has a gyroscope inbuilt, so if there's a sudden movement, 
in the glass, then it could, it, it could detect a fall potentially. Um, scheduling hangout chats with family, friends, and carers. One of my favorite applications was, uh, was potentially for people with Alzheimer's using the facial recognition component of glass to be able to prompt the name and relation to, to really help people who are struggling with memory loss. Um, and since a large proportion of senior citizens wear glasses, this makes for an obvious del delivery mechanism. As I said earlier, I'm not sure it's that obvious. I'm not sure my nan would say, you know what I need, a pair of Google Glass. But, <laughs> But it's certainly, they're familiar with the concept of glasses. You know, and again, I think probably at this moment in time, the elderly would probably struggle with Google Glass technology, but certainly you know, for this generation, for our generation as we get old, that won't be a foreign concept on any stretch to be able to interface with this sort of technology. So just, it was interesting from that point of view. Fight or flight was an idea about helping people to leave an emergency zone. So during bushfires or floods, when crucial decision making, whether it's safer to, to, to stay or whether to escape uh, the onslaught, wearing glass enables someone to be able to send accurate information either as they leave the scene or decide to stay. So the thinking there was in a situation where you need information in real time that is changing very, very quickly and where a fire is spreading or where routes could be blocked, it actually putting it there on your face as you're driving or you're moving or you're running or whatever else could actually be better rather than trying to check things and, and everything else. It could really aid people's ability to get out quickly. Um, and the final one was called Eye Council, which was around assisting in providing counselling for people who've been victims of natural disasters, often on site. So glass can be used to deliver a suggested script for the discussion, emphasising elements such as repeating someone's name and offering reassurance. Having the script presented on glass rather than on a separate screen allows the counsellor to maintain eye contact. I thought that was really nice. That's a really nice way of taking what is different about this technology to what is on your mobile phone. Well, it actually means you don't have to look down and take your eyes off the person you're talking to. It can still prompt from that point of view. So we thought that was a really nice application. So look, these are all just, these are ideas. They're ideas from, from a prototype perspective. But it was a really around thinking what technology could do for, for, for Red Cross as an organization moving forward. I wanted to sort of end on this quote because I, I hope it'll sort of feed into a little bit of the discussion we have now. And that's from Seth Godin around transitioning into the connection economy. And he, he proposes that value is created increasingly by the connections we make and no longer industrialism. You see that in the commercial space. We see that with the companies such as Google, Facebook, uh, even Apple to a degree. A lot of that value is being created by creating connections between companies and individuals or between individuals. Change.org is a fantastic example of a platform that is creating value. And as an organization as Red Cross, you're all about connecting people with people. It's, it's, it's exactly what you do. And so it feels that technology and digital can really only be an enabler to something that really is already core to the organization as a whole. So that's it from me. Um, I, I guess we shall, we shall move to questions now. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. I just thought uh, <clears throat> I would start off with a question and um, in, in thinking about uh, Red Cross, and as I said earlier, I'm still learning about it, and I tried to find out <clears throat> how many people each year we would connect with. I don't have an accurate answer, but in my estimate, it's well in excess of 200,000 people every year. Um, more than 50,000 clients, uh, 3,000 or so staff, 30,000 members and volunteers, uh, and in excess of 125,000 regular givers, plus one-off givers and those who uh, uh, respond to appeals. So we're touching a lot of people. Um, as we come to our 2020 strategy conclusions, how can we use technology in whatever form to connect with those individuals and engage with them? Um, there are different categories there, uh, each with different needs and requirements. So should we be prioritizing one over the other um, or can we find some way of collaborating across the different groups to produce a better result for the vulnerable, vulnerable people that we uh, want to help. So I'm not sure who wants to uh, jump in on that. Sure, I mean, I, I can start. I'm, we'll probably all have opinions because yeah. that's kind of how it seemed to work this morning. <laughs> yeah. um, I, th I think it's probably much more along the lines of what you were talking about in terms of the latter, which is collaborating and finding that. Because I think 
one of the incredibly rich things about organisations like the Red Cross is that ecosystem that exists. I think that it's, it's exploring the, the multi-stakeholder model that you have and being able to look at how do you experiment in small cycles for each of those and then see which ones of those investments to pay off and which ones to continue and drive towards and then which are the ones where you're like, that didn't quite work, let's try something slightly different. And I think that that approach of, of looking at multiple stakeholders at once and experimenting on multiple different levels will allow you to actually have a broader impact overall rather than picking one and going all the way down that stream and, and not necessarily having the right level of impact. Mm. Yeah, I, all I think about when, as soon as you said 300,000 people, all I was thinking about was imagine what would happen if you let those 300,000 people disseminate that message. Mm. Like that could be three million, right? Um, so for me, like it feels like the huge, the biggest opportunity, and this is often quite uncomfortable for a lot of organisations that I've worked with, <laughs> is letting go of your message and letting your all of those people you come into contact with disseminate that message for you. And there's a real like, of course, organisations want to control the message about their organisation, but actually enabling that huge network could yield very good results in the very, very short term. And, and we, have, we have done both of those things, and, and, and particularly in the fundraising sphere. Uh, we've tried certain things, we, and we experiment. Uh, we have our mainstream programs, but uh, there is innovation in, in different ways of targeting, different ways of bringing people in and bringing them back in again. Uh, yes. Yeah, so. I was going to say, I think from a um, digital, I mean, digital strategy, uh, digital strategy is often thought of as a, as a way of approaching isolation, and digital strategy really needs to lay up to what the organisation strategy is. So you kind of always got to start there and go, what is it as an organisation is most important and the, and the focus for you for the next three, five years, 20 years, and then ladder your digital efforts up to that. There will be some areas in which digital can have a over-representational impact, and some that might be more impactful in donation in driving donations than it will be in connecting volunteers or, or vice versa. So you've got to look at where it would be disproportionately impactful for the, for the organisation, but it should never sit in isolation of what is an organisation. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, and then it comes back to the know your customer, know your constituents. So yeah. how do they actually want to operate? How do they want to receive information? How will they then be likely to share that information? So if you have strategy and understanding of that group, then you can work out what the technology piece is. Right, thank you. Let's open it up for questions. There's a microphone up there. Uh, Mike's, uh, Mike's roving with the mic. Hi, my name's Wendy. I'm um, with the ACT Divisional Advisory Board. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting and I could see how it's really helpful around advocacy and for fundraising. But just picking up from Angela's research, um, it still leaves 23% of vulnerable and disadvantaged people unable to access the internet. And those that can, can generally only afford $50 a month. So that leads them to go to use free Wi-Fi, and we know that cyber security is a huge issue. People are getting hacked all the time, which makes potentially these people even more vulnerable. Just would like to hear your comments and thoughts around how do we support the most vulnerable people, which is really what Red Cross is trying to do. Um, I can probably talk a little bit to the, the security and the, the, the data angle. I think that there's a lot of work being done on, on multiple fronts around protecting privacy online. There's, there's people that think that privacy is dead. I am not one of them. I think that we, we pay for privacy all the time in our, in our offline lives, and I think we'll find that that becomes a concept online as well. So then I think the challenge is how do we ensure the same protections for people that don't have necessarily access to to the kind of money that the rest of us do. It's certainly an area that technologists are incredibly passionate about, most of the ones I work with. And again, it's looking at open sourcing solutions to that, many of which are just gonna be sort of speed humps along the way to people that are maliciously gonna be trying to hack your information anyway. But in the same way as in the physical world, locks and doors and you know armor, who knows, they're all sort of speed bumps along the way of, of protecting yourself. Um, technology can work in the same way. But I think that part of it is also around 
helping educate people about how to protect themselves. So there's an organisation that I've spent some time with called WIRE, which some of you might know here in, in Melbourne, that actually spend a lot of time helping um, some of the more vulnerable people, women in particular, understand how to use technology and how to protect themselves in using that technology. In particular, um, women that might have been the victims of domestic abuse, learning how to use social media in a way that they don't then necessarily share their whereabouts to people that they were victimised by. So a lot of it is around technologists coming up with ways to protect people. The second piece is around outreach and education. And the third is actually about policy. I mentioned before that the German government actually has data and privacy protections in legislation. I would really like to see that happen in other parts of the world as well. And I think it's, it's reasonably obvious when you think about it that a country that actually had in living memory um, a lot of issues with people using data and using surveillance in malicious ways is one of the first ones to actually legislate against that. So I'm curious to see how other countries you know, follow that up. Just to kind of speak on that disadvantage issue, I think the first thing to acknowledge is we're only part of the way there, right? Like, it's, if you, just in context, in India, we had, you know, 100 users, I think, a year ago in India. We've got a million now, so there, it, we're not going to get there straight away as much as we were talking earlier about wanting everything to happen now. <laughs> um, but it might take a little while. Uh, but again, I think a lot of this is poli a policy issue. You know, here in Australia, we have a huge issue with internet access in remote Aboriginal communities. And, you know, we still run petitions with remote Aboriginal communities, but I was saying we, a lot of the time we have to call them on the phone <laughs> to, get, to get petition updates done. Like, that's the reality. Um, so, you know, the NBN would be a very good solution to that, wouldn't it? Um, so there are, there are policy solutions, I think, as well, that would allow us to address some of this. But I think we, get, we are making progress. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, I've got it. Um, I was just following on from the question that you asked at the start, which is around all the different current relationships that Red Cross has. And we have probably, we're in contact with uh, probably a million people a year in Australia. Um, but one of the questions I had was, a lot of the time when you hear about digital solutions or you hear your case studies, they're all about point solutions to a particular problem. And obviously Red Cross has a huge number of stakeholders, a huge number of people that are involved in it, and those relationships are not always one relationship. They might be a regular giver and a member or a regular giver and a beneficiary even. How do you see that working for an organisation that has complicated relationships when it comes to privacy and it comes to... Um, managing that person's, because I, I, I hear that you say, you know, you should let people come to you um, and to find their own context, but how does an organisation like Red Cross keep track of that context using digital? The first question is, do you need to keep track of all of that content? I don't know, there's a, there's a whole thing. I mean, it, I was actually up at a conference in Sydney on Thursday and Friday and they had a representative from the Democratic National Committee. They're talking about their fundraising activity and like, if you guys think a million's large, you know, try 20 million. So organisations do have solutions to managing it. Often it's like legacy systems. So, I mean, I'm just going to take a stab in the dark about how many different databases your organisation has. I'm guessing at least one for fundraising, at least one for volunteers, at least one for staff. Like, integration is, I think, a very good starting point for managing some of these, some of those issues. And that, you know, that's actually an issue that the DNC was grappling with, with the 20 million odd people that they come into contact with in various ways as well. So bigger organisations have tackled it, um, but I think it starts with the integration. I don't know if other people... I think the other part is not necessarily taking that all onto yourself. Like, there's other social networks that are really powerful to use as platforms. So there's a level of... With, with the almost ubiquitous nature of the internet and with platforms like Facebook and Twitter and those sorts of pieces, there's, there's an ability, I think, to have much more of a conversation with all of those different stakeholders that is around, let's cluster around an issue, which is something you'd be very <laughs> familiar with, rather than necessarily having to do the outreach yourself. You can do that and have other people work for you for free yep. to spread that through their own social networks which are probably similar to some of the... If you looked at the data and you looked at the groups of people you have in each of those databases, there are probably other related secondary social networks that somehow connect them as well. And so part of thinking about how to access 
all of those different relationships is thinking about how other organisations can help you do that and how other nodes in that network, to take it more technically, how humans in that network can actually be um, rebroadcasters for you as well. Yeah. I think too that getting the operating model right so that you've got a good mix of centralization and then being able to distribute it down so you might hold you know, brand and risk policy and, and things in a centralized way but then you allow the different uh, units or you know, different individuals that are working then out to represent different constituent groups to you know, use their own voice or use a, an approach that, that might be somewhat innovative, you know, test and learn a concept or something like that. So I think getting that how we work articulated and then agreeing that is, is pretty important as well. I think it's definitely scary though. Like, I mean, we, we have things like this, well, we were talking earlier, I mean, Christopher Pine started a petition to save his local electorate from <laughs> ABC cuts last week. You know, that's not something we would have anticipated. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's scary when you let people create their own content yeah. sometimes. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's definitely un, an uncomfortable thing. You need to have processes around how that's you right. deal with those sorts of things. Right. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Pat Pearson. I'm from the Victorian Advisory Board. Um, I'm just curious to know, and really what advice you might give us. We're, as, as an organisation, Red Cross, we're underpinned by really clear um, you know, sets of principles, particularly humanity and neutrality. And I take the comment that you made about, like, we've got 30,000 people. If they all had 10, there'd be 300,000. How do you use social media to advance the work of Red Cross? And But bearing in mind that we are underpinned by principles which, particularly the principle of neutrality, the, about the position we take on certain things. What advice would you give us um, about that? Well, I think a lot of organisations have a commitment to political neutrality and I don't think there's any problem with that. I think what is really important is telling the stories of the people that you help. That's the most powerful thing. And you know, there's a whole, you know, people then can then make their own decisions about the policies that they think will best support those people. So, you know, I was speaking to someone earlier about this incre the incredible stories of the people that you help, that is what cuts through policy noise and those are the things that need to be heard. So I think as an organisation, I would be saying to you, focusing on amplifying the voices of the people that you help will, is not political, but incredibly important. And, and that can, no, that can come from a content perspective. I mean, from social media is all really about sharing content, and the, the, the most successful from a social media point of view is it comes down to the quality of the content. So if you can create great content and, sh and control the content and represent it in a way that you want to represent it in a neut neutrality way, if you're creating great content, that will naturally get shared and amplified. And, you know, as we say, it's that balance between you don't want to be over-controlling, but if you create great things that really stand for what Red Cross stand for and, and represent you in the best possible light, and it's great quality content, it will get shared and amplified naturally. Hi, I'm John. I'm a human resources volunteer from Adelaide. Uh, in response to one question is how many databases do we have? <laughs> we have two. One is specifically for staff and the other is known as Mavis. <laughs> yes, and there's a lot, yeah. Uh, which stands for Members and Volunteers Information System or Service, if it works. And I think that was developed shortly after the abacus. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I unfortunately have inherited the role of the local expert. Uh, one of, in relation to that, how can we survive, if that's his Red Cross, with such an antiquated system? I mean, there was talk five years ago that Mavis was going to be replaced. IT have told us not to hold our breath. <laughs> so in five years' time, if we've still got that, I can't see how we are going to, you know, come of age. The other point was uh, something that was said by the last speaker with regard to people of my age uh, who are, you know, baby boomers about accepting uh, new technology. I think you'll find that baby boomers are not reluctant in accepting change or, uh, or embracing new technology. But one of the fears that we have is that social 
and networking is now digital. And it is rather, we tend to raise our eyebrows when you see people in the same room, instead of talking face to face, <laughs> texting one another. I mean, are we going to lose that ability, which is so important to Red Cross, to be able to speak face to face with our clients? I mean, I, I think that the face, I know it goes without saying always, but that face-to-face -face thing just never goes away. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about the fact that, you know, we're, we're, we're digitally-led organisations and there is an immense amount of travel that <laughs> still needs to take place because relationships are built through incidental contact, not through transactional. And, however, I do think that you can have rich incidental contact in the digital space. I just think that part of that is shifting. So I think all of the things are always important, but I think that mixture of face-to-face -face contact is still important. I'm not a digital native, I'm a, a what do we call ourselves? Gen X. Yeah, Gen we're sort of like the people that, almost. yeah, like came, weren't born into it, but came along to it, and, and probably quick adopters, but that doesn't mean that I'm like, dude, why didn't you spend three hours a night talking to people on the telephone when you're in high school? Because yeah. that was an incredibly rich experience for me, and in talking to kids now using Snapchat or, or other social media to have similar experiences, they talk about those experiences with just as much passion. And I think it's a matter of you know, having multiple levels of, of engagement across different channels for different contexts. To, to your database question, so you know, you're doing a 2020 strategy now, so you've got your organizational strategy. I've talked about knowing your customer. So then there's the enablers of that strategy that if, it, if it's not captured in that document, then that would be the next thing around how do we enable this strategy that should come out loud and clear. I mean, that would be how that would flow through and that would need to be captured. As if we want to do all these things, we've got to have the right data and we've got to have a modern database and it's got to integrate. My question's actually kind of similar. You talked um, a little bit about data silos when you're talking about the different databases. Um, and beyond getting people to work for free and this idea of rebroadcasting <laughs> and creation of content, there's a lot of information that we already have about our service delivery and our clients and who volunteers and, and what areas need help. So what strategies can we use as well to um, unlock the data silos and, and use big data analysis to optimise how we deliver the current services? Um, I mean, big data is one of the, the buzzwords of everyone that, that you know, it's, it's a crazy level of, of information and there's a lot of organisations that are now getting scared of, of big data that are now saying we're making these data driven decisions and they're not quite right. I think data informed decisions are still really important so I think spending some time understanding what you do have as a resource is incredibly important. There are people that, that do like terrifying math wizards that do that for a living um, that find unbelievably rich information in, in things that for most folks like me that look at it that see you know, certain types of, of data can actually build correlations and patterns between those pieces of information. And then it's your decision as an organisation how far down that path you want to go. Um, there are specialists in doing this and I would suggest using them. I think make sure you don't fall into the trap of, of thinking of what, you, of what we've got as, as big data. So when, when people are really thinking about big data, they're talking about terabytes and terabytes of information, the, the sort of stuff that comes out of radio telescopes in Western Australia. Um, I think we've got data, I think it's a much it's really rich, but it's a much smaller um, data set that we're talking about. And I think you can get very good data anal like analysts and analytics without having to go down the terrifying maths path. Um, and there's some great tools online that you can actually use to, to start doing those. Just check what they're going to do with the data that you put into them first. <laughs> just, uh, good, 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 just to add to that as well, I think that's, that there's a sort of there's a scaremongering around big data that's really, that's really intimidating and daunting. And yet, from a technology point of view, we've never had better technology to explore and aggregate data and analyze it than ever before. So, you know, when I, 10 odd years ago when I was working as a data analyst, things that would take me five hours to run then take a matter of seconds to run now. So, and whilst the wealth of data has increased exponentially too, so has our ability to deal with it. So it's, it's always gonna be a challenge. I think it is, it is yeah. a continual challenge. You need the right people looking at it. But I feel like in the industry there's a scaremongering about it being too daunting. We're actually, we've never been better empowered to, yeah. to handle it in many ways. It can yield <laughs> sig significant fundraising returns. So actually this, de this guy from the Democratic National Committee was talking about how they'd use data to dramatically personalize their fundraising yeah. program. And that had yielded like something like a 15% increase on fundraising returns. So there are incredible returns there that would 
undoubtedly probably recoup any investment in looking into those types of things. I think we have time for just one more question. Is there, is there something that hasn't been dealt with before? Is it working? Yeah, um, an observation that I think there's one area where I think we've gone backwards. Uh, we have put a fair bit of effort into putting digital interface on the front of our disintegration uh, and we've actually used uh, the technology to push a lot of corporate support services back out to the, uh, the work, to the coalface and getting pe taking people away from doing service delivery because they're now becoming the actual administrators and operators of the organisation. But the main, that's just a quick observation. The main question I had was, from Red Cross in particular point of view, the word trust has come up a lot over the last two days and it's a very particular relevance to us. And a lot of the interactions that I can see people wanting to do with the message, um, I've heard comments with the, the message or the content as it being something that we put out there. But I'm seeing that increasingly the, the users or the, the community is looking for an interactive interface where it, it can be that interactive messaging or the question comes back and forth, back and forth. We're locked into a paradigm of all our external content goes through a centralised process of sign-off that's you know, slow, cumbersome, unwieldy um, at times. <laughs> and uh, that uh, we, the, the challenge of potentially turning it from just being a small department that is that interface out with the community to mobilising that 3,000 staff in the first instance and then we've got the, the, the many tens of thousands of volunteers. But I'm just wondering about your experience about other organisations that may have faced up to that and ways that they looked at balancing that. For us it's a very, very high risk of getting the, the trust angle right because um, our entire effectiveness as an organisation is completely built around the way that logo is perceived and only takes a very you know, we've got very, very low risk tolerance for, for interfering with the, the faith map. So I was wondering if any, any um, observations from other organisations, how that approached that conundrum. So, so we're, we're an accounting firm, fundamentally, Deloitte, and if we breach client confidentiality or audit rules or ASIC rules or whatever, we are in big, big trouble. So in 2008, when our CEO decided we've got to get active on social media, and he's a guy that, he's 58 years old, and he said, this is super important to us as a firm because 75% um, of our staff are under the age of 35. And we need to hire 500 graduates every year to keep our firm growing. So this is super important. So he said at a leadership level, I don't necessarily understand social media, but we have to do it. We have to get it right. So he tasked, he got a group of people together to set up a social media committee. And it was chaired by our, uh, our chief legal counsel. And he said to her, I need you to make this work. So she could have been the principal blocker but she was given the task of, of making it work. And, and she put you know, digital people on, our chief marketing officer, she put on our head of uh, risk and compliance and things. And so we worked out a, a bunch of principles around how we would, we would express ourselves in social networks. We didn't have to create any new policies or any, we had them all. We had everything that we needed. We just had to be able to communicate them to the people that were using the tools. And what we decided was you know, our graduate recruiting area is an area that's pretty safe. It's unlikely we're going to be disclosing client information in a dialogue with graduates or, or students. And our graduate recruiters are all digital natives that are very savvy. They're out at universities every day and they get this stuff and they get how to use, you know, 140 characters and a hashtag and a mention and things. And so we started to get that dialogue going and, and kind of found a voice and we got people comfortable with that. And we started to then bring in some of the senior partners, so like our, our head of the economics team or head of tax to do uh, Facebook chats. So, so starting to then engage in these social networks and get used to it. And um, we decided then pretty soon into that, that you know, we do an uh, analysis of the federal budget every year. And what that used to be was these guys analyzing and writing a report and three days later this popping out. One of them had done a Facebook chat with students and decided, all right, actually what we're gonna do is we're gonna live tweet the analysis of the federal budget. And if we get that wrong, you know, we're in the Fin Review and massive brand damage and all kinds of things. So we had a risk and compliance person, an economist, and a digital, you know, one of my team sitting there, and the economist would say, okay, this is the insight here around this piece of the budget. Risk and compliance person would say, okay, that's fine. And then digital person would, okay, here's 140 characters, that about right, post. So that was the first year. 
But then what happened is the economics team went through that over a few years. They understood the things they couldn't say, the way they couldn't say it, what was safe, what was not. They had people on the team come through that knew how to do 140 character tweet, whatever. So now when we do this live tweeting, you've got one person in the economics team that does that and we all kind of stand back and we trust that they're going to get it right. So you've got to build it up over time. You've got to control it a bit and then you've got to empower and trust basically. No, thank you for that. That was a great question to finish on. Thank you very much. So look, we've, I think we've eaten into a little bit of your uh, afternoon tea time, but please thank uh, Frank, Angela, Anna and David. Thank you very much.